and uh, Dr. Rahul, as well as the uh, innovation uh, team who has invited me to give you a talk for 20 minutes, 50 to 20 minutes. Uh, basically, I am a, a national laboratory guy. I think the sound is, is OK. Yeah. So the uh, lecture, he told me that uh, I can give you a talk in uh, energy storage uh, session. So I have chosen the topic uh, uh, batteries and magnets. Magnets also energy storage, which are all forgotten for electric vehicle. I would like to give some glimpses of the challenges in the technology. But before going into that, I'd like to have some background to the energy storage so that where we go, what will be the future trend in this uh, energy technology, especially the lithium and battery technology, so that uh, we can look at it, uh, how do we move forward in 2025, 2030, and so on. Uh, I would like to begin with these numbers. Always in all my presentations, I keep uh, putting this table. Uh, this is nothing but uh, various uh, three different sectors, not all the sectors I have put. Electronic sector, that is uh, portable devices like uh, microphone, uh, TVs and all, transport, stationary applications. The typical energy required per unit I have given here, you can imagine that the demand of uh, the, all these sectors, the number of units which we are going to have in 2040, 2050 and all, and accordingly, the energy is going to be very, very high. Are we really geared up to meet this, all this energy demand? And are we developing the energy storage systems for that is the question. Uh, I will not go into the, all those details. I would like to only cover only the transport sector, where uh, the energy demand is uh, growing drastically because of uh, the information what I have put here. Uh, this chart, you can see that Oil is the major use for uh, transportation. 65% uh, is being used by transport sector. It may be much more higher. I prepared this uh, chart in 2015. Consequence is that we have all pollution caused by the transportation sector. If uh, the automotive sector is going to depend oil as a source of energy, you can see this uh, curve where the demand is going to increase uh, drastically exponentially. At the same time, the resources are depleting like anything. There's going to be a huge petroleum gap. That's what I put, the energy demand for automotive sector. It's going to increase down the line 2040, 2050, if you're going to depend on oil as a source of energy. In addition to that, uh, there is also the energy loss in the automotive sector. If you give 100% energy for transmission, you don't use all the 100% energy for uh, moving in the vehicle. Only 25% is used for transporting it. Rest of the energy goes in the form of a heat loss. So that means there is an energy demand and an energy loss. It puts the material scientists to work on yeah, better devices, material devices, components, so that uh, we can go forward to cater these two uh, 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 critical factors, demand and the loss. Uh, one solution, all of you know here, is that for automotive sector, electric vehicle is uh, an important solution. Uh, this is a cartoon, which uh, the youngsters can see that we have a rechargeable battery and a motor. Motor is basically a magnet, rare earth permanent magnet that controls the thing. That's what I told that magnet battery are important energy storage devices for electric vehicle. Then controller, of course, all these things are uh, Controller basically uh, yeah, connecting it for the transmission purpose. We can also have a hybrid system, uh, internal combustion engine, electric motor, and then uh, the battery. So this is a simple uh, 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 solutions which uh, people look at that. But now coming into the current situation, we are running out of fossil fuels and they are polluting our world. We know that very well. Even today news also morning, if you look at it, Delhi, what is uh, the pollution is uh, really alarming. So we need almost 60% more energy in 30 years. That's what Morning Professor Ashok also mentioned about it. Oil experts estimate that we will use all our oil resources within the next 40 years. That was the gap I put, that petroleum gap. The resources are going to deplete quite a bit. So what we are going to do that? What types of energy storage would we use? We have wind, sea, nuclear, solar, 
coal. Look at different types of energy, then discuss our choices of energy storage. I am not an expert. There are all experts on solar, coal, sea, wind energy. Morning we have seen some of the presentations. But I would like to give some glimpses of these energies when they combine with the batteries as a hybrid. It's going to be very, very useful for us as a energy, powerful energy storage devices. Wind energy, of course, advantage is renewable, non-polluting, well-proven technology. There are also disadvantages because it is seasonal. July or June will have maximum wind so that you can extract the power. Solar, of course, India is a tropical country, tropical country. Almost 300 days we have sunlight. So we'll be able to trap that energy. Of course, we need to have storage of those energy sources here uh, so that far we can tap it uh, whenever we want to use it. We have, uh, we can combine wind, solar hybrid system for rooftop uh, applications where wind turbine can be controlled with, uh, connected with the wind controller, put a battery bank. We can also have solar panel, PV array, solar charge controller, put into battery pack, DC loads, inverter, AC loads. This is yet another system for energy storage for applications which we can think about. That's what I call it a hybrid system. Of course, sea power is yet another thing. I remember uh, when Dr. Abdul Kalam was uh, uh, the DG, Director General of DRDO, where I was working earlier. One student wrote a mail to him, uh, sent a letter to him saying that uh, so many cyclones in Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, then Andhra Pradesh, then Orissa and all. Can we not tap that cyclonic power and use it for our many other applications? Because cyclonic power is very, very high. So the sea around the coast has the potential to generate large amounts of electricity. But the technology is really yet to emerge out, new technology, which we like to really worry about it, how to tap that energy. Nuclear power, of course, we're not going to the detail. We are one of the nuclear power uh, centers in the country, uh, uh, globally. So we have nuclear power also, but it has its own disadvantages. I will not go into the details of that. Uh, currently, we are comfortable with the coal, gas, and oil. Oil experts estimate that we'll use all our resources. I mentioned that in 40 years, it will be over. And it has relatively cheap to produce, but prices are rising. The resources are running out. This is a disadvantage. So keeping in view of all those things, ERCA, our lab, one of the DST labs in the country, autonomous bodies, uh, we have framed a bigger project on setting up a technical research center for alternative energy materials and systems, uh, catering almost all the uh, uh, applications what we'll be looking at for energy storage. One is the battery, lithium-ion battery. Then we have the FEM fuel cell, hydrogen-based proton exchange in membrane fuel cell supercapacitor, which is running at Hyderabad. Then we have a thermoelectric. You know, if you look at a car or a scooter, auto exhaust pipe, you'll see a gas, hot gas coming out. The temperature is 200 degrees to 800 degrees or 600 degrees. That heat is going as a waste. If you put a thermoelectric module in the uh, exhaust pipe, you can convert that heat into useful power and you can give it to the car itself or a scooter itself for operating it. Then there is a magnetocaloric, magnetic refrigeration. Morning, uh, Professor Ashok was talking about uh, heating and cooling, you know, for generating, storing energy. Here, you have your magnet. You apply a magnetic field to that. It gets heated up. Remove the magnetic field, it gets cooled. It's very similar to adiabatic uh, compression and expansion, equivalent to adiabatic magnetization, demagnetization. That's the physics. Giving right to he heating and cooling. Noiseless, efficiency, very small size can be made. A lot of challenges are there to make it. So we have some small programs going on at the lab here. Most importantly, electric vehicle, as I mentioned that motors needs the powerful rare earth permanent magnets. In the country, we do not have the technology. We import from China and put it as a rotor in the magnet, in the uh, electric vehicle. And also there is a technology which is not available for electric vehicle, the silicon steel, which is used as a stator and we import the technology, okay? We have to develop a new alloy or material so that the electric vehicle, both stator and rotor, goes as the energy storage magnetic materials for the 
mortar application. This is very, very important, which we have made a major milestone in the country, which we are able to cater for the applications for the industries are looking for it. Now for the general uh, uh, audience who are um, uh, willing to know about the energy storage systems, various energy storage systems, I have put this uh, graph based on two uh, figure of merits. Uh, one is called power density, and is another one is energy density. If you look at it, capacitors, normal capacitors will have high power density. The supercapacitors will have relatively high power density, but it will have relatively low energy density. Whereas the batteries will have a good combination of relatively high power density as well as energy density. Fuel cell will have high energy density, but relatively low power density. On the other hand, combustion engine, gas turbine, they will have high power density, high energy density, but we are going to we are not interested to work on that because of the pollution, what we are looking at, near net carbon. So if you look at it, all these things, batteries are the most preferred energy storage systems. And batteries, I stress that you can also have a combination with the supercapacitor or fuel cell and make us a hybrid system. So batteries are going to play a crucial role for energy storage systems. The batteries, again, with respect to power density and energy density, various materials are available. And most of you, all of you know that lithium ion battery is the powerful material at this moment. It gives uh, energy density somewhere around 150 to 250 whatever per kg. For the young researchers, I want to define what is uh, the energy density. It is a capacity of a battery that can hold per gram or per kg. Power is nothing but the ability to deliver power per kg. This is very, very important. Based on the end users applications, both will be defined for, for the process of the, defining the chemistry of the batteries. Uh, this is for industry uh, users, uh, those who want to know about uh, some of the aspects which you have to look into the battery chemistry when you want to use it for application. I put as a triads of lithium ion cell with a different chemistry, known chemistry, all are commercially available, lithium iron phosphate, Lithium nickel cobalt aluminum, lithium nickel manganese cobalt, that's called NMC. This is a spider chart. Don't look into the, all these things. There are five parameters I have defined in this pie chart. One is energy density. This decides driving range, how much, how long, how, how much distance it can go. Power density defines the speed. Safety, of course, the flammability. All of us know that recent, uh, many last few months, we know that what's happening in the vehicles. Cyclability, number of charge discharge cycles, that should be having also greater than 80% capacity retention. Cost, of course, the industry will be looking for cheaper battery. If you look at it, all these factors, uh, this fellow, lithium iron phosphate, has a good combination of all these parameters. And I also usually, uh, I keep telling many of the forums that uh, like India, tropical weather condition, this material will be the best suited material for electric vehicle. We should remember the guys, uh, top words, uh, Star Wars, who discovered all this chemistry, obtained Nobel Prize in 2018 for lithium ion battery inventors. For students, research scholars, I brought these pictures. I wanted to recall these people's invention. Uh, now, coming to the importance of the battery, lithium ion battery for vehicle, uh, the role of battery chemistry and vehicle range. I take a car, want to drive 500 kilometer range. If I use lead acid battery, it needs about 3,000 kg weight. If I go to nickel metal hydride battery, for the same 500 kilometer range, I need only around 1,000, 1,200 kg. So it's a huge weight reduction. It's a huge efficiency for the vehicle. On the other hand, if you go to the lithium ion batteries, you can see that the weight can be reduced further, 500 kg. I can put a red line template where if you work on super battery, less than 200 kg, with a higher energy density, then that's a real game champion. That's what everybody is working on, developing new cathode, new anode materials, so that we can go for higher energy density, and so that weight saving is an important factor for auto industry. Not only for auto industry, aerospace industries too. This is the transformation, which has happened from 1907, 
electric vehicle, Edison's vehicle, and you can see that the Toyota Pirus car, how they have, uh, I think it's the Toyota Pirus car if I remember it. Discovery of new materials like lithium ion battery, magnets for motors, made this transformation of technology. Even you can see the charging now, charging technology also has become a new technology as emerged out. Uh, simple uh, calculation, when I worked with Ashok Leyland initially for a project uh, for ARCA, lithium ion battery project, uh, I got a data. Uh, this is a map, Google map, Mumbai to Pune, Pune to back Mumbai. Around 300 kilometers is the total distance travel. If you use a diesel bus, 300 kilometers a day, at the rate of two kilometers per liter of diesel, it will generate 180 tons of CO2. Maybe now it might have come down now, the technology would have been slightly better. But this is a number is very high per year. Hybrid electric vehicle, on the other hand, it will reduce by 25% GHC, greenhouse gas emissions. If you go for fewer electric vehicle, you can go to really near net zero carbon. That's what the aim of the electric vehicle technology. Uh, the market is quite good, not only for electric vehicle, for stationary applications, the evolving market is 20% CAGR. Transportation sector, rapidly growing market, 30%. And the electronic devices, 5% CAGR, and it may grow high. There are many other applications are also emerging out. In India, I took this data, maybe numbers may be now uh, wrong, but relatively this, you can scale it up or reduce it, whatever uh, the policy or the analysis analysts are here. Uh, I put only the electric vehicle and uh, the market price, uh, market size, 2019, it was around 1,000 crore. Maybe now I don't know what is the numbers which Rahul may tell us clearly. Uh, the expected market size is around 25 crore, 25,000 crore. The huge market is emerging out only for the electric vehicle sector alone. That means the people who are venturing into the cell manufacturing unit, uh, plant, they are going to have a great boom for the market in the country. Of course, the export also is going to be a thing. Why I said that is that India, globally, we really number three, number four, number six in various uh, vehicles, two-wheelers or tractors, if you look at it. And in India, if you look at the map, whether north or west or south or east, we have very good spread of automotive sectors. Manufacturers, components, traders, international companies, manufacturing people and all. So there is a great opportunity for automotive industry slowly transform from what we are having today to 2047 or 2050 electric vehicle technology. Unfortunately, what happened is India, the cell manufacturing has not taken place very fast. PLA has, scheme has come up now. Maybe another two years or three years we'll be seeing uh, industries producing cells. Without that, millions of vehicles, millions of vehicles we are talking about, to meet that demand, we will still depend on import of the batteries. If you look at it, the countries like US, China, Japan, Europe, 2020, you can see the China's uh, uh, capacity, around 800 gigawatt hour capacity. If you look at it, 2025, what they have is around 2,500, no, total I have put here, 73%. So, we are nowhere near, we are talking about um, 10 gigawatt, 100 gigawatt capacity and all. So, we are really move fast, much faster to in this, in this energy storage technology so that we have cell manufacturing technology is available, multiple manufacturing technologies available in the country. Uh, in the whole technology, I forgot to tell about it, the cost is an important factor, which industry always come in to ask uh, the cell manufacturers. Uh, this number, I made it long back. Actually, in fact, 2010, it was $1,000 per kilowatt hour, the battery cost. In 2015, I put 500 kilowatt hour, 500 dollars per kilowatt hour. Now it is around 200 or 250, 160 to 250 dollars per kilowatt hour. In this entire thing, cost, if you look at it, raw materials and material processing cost. That's what I want to stress that for the industry that cell manufacturing cost mostly goes into the materials and the material processing. In that itself, if you look into that, 75% of the total cost comes from cathode anode and separator and electrolyte. Country like India, we do not have still the manufacturing of these materials like anode, cathode, separator, electrolyte. 
ARCA, we have transformed, transferred some of the technologies to industries. Maybe another two years or three years, we'll be able to see some of these large-scale manufacturing in the country. This is our effort to make large scale of these uh, electrode materials, transfer the technology to industries. So various uh, methods. This is the process uh, technology what we have developed at ARCI. Uh, we have set up uh, in IIT Research Park 7th floor. We have uh, all the equipment for making from the uh, electrode to final assembly, cell manufacturing we have kept here. And it is possible to make 100 kilowatt hour capacity. This is a national lab. So 24 by 7, if you work, we'll be able to make 100 kilowatt hour capacity plant. It's quite good. It's a pilot scale facility. And we have uh, many things uh, installed there. Capabilities of making assorted types of batteries, testing facilities. We also have some of the um, uh, testing facilities for qualifying the industrial batteries also. So small video, if I have time, I will put it. How the uh, batteries is manufactured, you must know that. This is uh, electrode preparation, uh, slurry making. Then uh, the slurry will be put on a substrate. After uh, making its viscosity measured, everything, it's a substrate on which it is coated. We can make continuous coating or a uh, uh, programmed coating for tabs to weld it also. Then we have a calendaring machine. We have a slitting machine. This is a, again a slitting machine which cuts as per your dimensions you want to want to make. This is the winding, both separator, anode, cathode, you can wind and then make the prismatic or cylindrical, whatever the dimensions you want to make it. Then laser welding then electrolyte filling, then uh, go for the final assembly cell testing. And then we have to prove it also in house the uh, properties. So we use the, our own vehicle, which we have tried and put it and then see its specifications what it meets for the vehicle. So this is uh, like a in house demonstration. And based on that, we have gone to the industries for testing our vehicles. So this is the technology which we have proven seen by top people, and uh, we are transferred for auto tri-wheeler also now. We also give training, OK? There are, if I don't have time, if someone asks me, I can tell about the future batteries. There are the future batteries available. Uh, this is the strategy which one has to adopt uh, in the country for sustainable energy storage application, we should have battery supply chain. I will not read all the things. Then production, process, manufacturing, and end use applications numbers. We will have to have the numbers available there. OK, so with that, I would like to close. I'm sorry I exceeded uh, five minutes. Uh, thank you for your patience. I'm ready to answer anything uh, during the panel discussion also. Thank you, sir. Please also join me in welcoming Dr.